welcome to Love at First Laugh, the Green Room Edition. And today I'm so excited because I have an amazing guest. I've known her for years. She is one of the most talented human beings I've ever met. Uh, she has been the winner of the best solo show and solo performer in Los Angeles and San Francisco. Her solo show, Squeeze, was produced off Broadway by, check this out, Mel Brooks and the late Anne Bancroft. I mean, crazy, okay? And and to top it off, you know how, what Mel said about her, Mel Brooks? She said, she's a genius, okay? And now we have her a love at first laugh. So please welcome my dear friend, Anne Randolph. Great. Hi, Anne. <laughs> Hi Grace. Great to see you. Great to see you too. It's been forever. Yeah, and I just want to tell everybody out there, I look like one big giant red lobster because I've been in the beach and I got like, you know, burned to death. So I'm looking at you and you have this perfect skin and I'm like, ah. So oh, don't worry, it's on the lighting and the makeup. Don't yeah, don't. Start. Everything's lighting. Yeah, it's everything. I have two big ass lights, so it's all good. Um, so what is your joke now? I have to tell you between, what's the difference between uh, 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 porn and erotica? Lighting. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> exactly. Well, yeah. Uh, so I, I love that you are doing the show and I'm so excited to uh, talk with you. We haven't talked in a million years. Uh, it's It's been, yeah, a long time, way too long. So yeah. where are you living now? I'm living in Hawaii. Oh my God. Just, just a little bit of paradise, Grace. Oh my God, so lucky. Yeah. That's amazing. Yeah. And, you know, I want to start with this. I mean, okay, so how how did you feel when Mel Brooks, the Mel freaking Brooks, called you a genius? I mean, did you like pee your pants? What what happened? How did you feel? Yes, I did, Grace. I peed my pants right then and there. No, it was just like uh, <laughs> I mean, he's like the comedy god, and for a comedy god, I mean, to recognize and say your genius, that was just like holy shit. This was like yeah. one of those moments I will never ever forget. And so it was like backstage after my show at this little tiny crappy theater on La Cienega Boulevard, and he came to that crappy theater, and he came right backstage and said that. I'm like, oh my god, that's insane. He also <laughs> said, he goes, I want to make a movie of this, and. Oh and my God, he said that? Yeah, and I'm like, what? Am I hearing this? Because I have been working, by that time, I think eight years, the graveyard shift at minimum wage for $8.60 an hour. And I'm like, yeah. oh, this could be a game changer. So No kidding. So, okay, but how, how did you have Mel Brooks go to your show? I mean, who, who invited him? Did how you did that happen? Well, it's a great question, Grace, because, well, I didn't know. I did. I was like, is this really true or not? So his future daughter-in-law was in my writing workshop, but I did not know that she was dating their son, Max Brooks. And she kept saying to me over and over again, I'm going to bring my in-laws. And me not knowing who her in-laws were, I was like, we'll bring whoever the fuck you want. I don't care. Yeah. You know? <laughs> we need to go to the theater. We're good. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> we need all the people we can get. Bring your grandpa, your relative, bring them all. Yeah. And there she is with them. And then there's Ann and Mel. And I'm like, oh, my God, it's, it's Mel Brooks and Ann Bancroft. I can't, I can't. I can't. I can't. So when you saw them, you were, you didn't know they were going. So when you saw them, you were like, what is going yeah, on? What's happening? What's going on? Yeah. It was like, oh, holy. Yeah. And then you do spot them right in the audience. And you're what I'm you aware now. I'm aware that oh, they're wow. laughing. And then there are also there's some sad moments as a narrative arc, and they're also, uh, you know, very deeply moved. So it was a really beautiful, beautiful moment experience on stage. Of course, I was so scared, but you know, right. did that? How did you handle that? Because all of a sudden you're there and you see them, and you're like, holy shit! Like you wait, thinking all these things, and and how did you continue to like be you? <laughs> Yeah, I just had to in my mind, like, because you you want to amp up as a comedian, or you want to amp up, and you want to like knock it out of the park and get each joke. Yeah. The minute you do that, you pull out of the story. So I had to really like focus on, and I couldn't look at them too often. I had to constantly go back to people yeah. that I felt like, oh, these are supportive faces. I can go to this face, and I'm going to purposely slow down the delivery of the line 
even though it didn't in real time, in my mind, I had to trick myself to slow down because I could feel. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Oh, that's so funny. Yeah. No, I mean, I don't even know how you continued. I would have passed out. Yeah. Uh, wow. That's yeah. amazing. So, 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 okay. So here they are. So they go backstage and they freaking love you and they want to make it into a movie and they want to produce your show. So what's the next step? What happens next? Well, the next thing was, well, they said to me, and this was really interesting. They said, well, the two of the main characters, of course, was me. I was playing, I play like 12 different characters. And one was yeah. me uh, who had worked these eight years at this homeless shelter. And so, and, but another character in the show was this crack whore who named Brandy and she's, out of control and she's aging crack course. So she's not getting a lot of tricks. And, uh, and <laughs> Anne Bancroft came up to me and said, and I'd like to play that character, this crack whore. I'm like, Oh my God, this is like, this like, is like, like wow. Did you think and you were dreaming and like, you were like, yeah. what's happening? Yeah. Right. Yeah. And then they said, um, what do you want? And at that point I said, this sounds incredible. And I can't believe I said, I said, I would like to do this on stage in New York. And they go, we will make this all happen. We will make this happen. So this was like total, uh, total um, game changer. I mean, and I worked for, now I didn't quit the shelter immediately because look, they do what's called an option, meaning. Right. Now my show at that point was two hours and 20 minutes with an in intermission. That's oh, not that's long. Show. Yeah. And Mel said, you're not going to take it to New York to get it down to 90 minutes, 80 minutes. And so you're going to work with me. So then I had. Wait, 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 wait. You worked with the Mel Brooks. Yes, I did. Great. Oh, my God. <laughs> oh, my God. I'm sorry. Wow. Yeah. To oh shape that God. show. It was really challenging because if you're. Even our, you know, you're in love with your babies, and it had one best solo show in in Los Angeles at this point. I'm like, well, Mel, it won an award. He's like, no, it's way too long, and yeah. you know, I can't believe I'm like, you know, questioning the genius, right? But you, I, you know, yeah, he was so right. They both were so right. I had to get it down to 90 minutes, but they were incredibly patient. So like maybe this was 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 really challenging. So I'm at the shelter. And then, like Mel Brooks would now call the shelter. How's it going? What's how? What's the problem? <laughs> wait, wait, wait! Can you call the shelter for you? Oh, I can't. Yeah, yeah. That's wow! It's blowing my mind. Okay, so that's that's amazing. It's, so you guys work on like getting it to ninety minutes. You got it to ninety minutes, and then what happened? Well, let me just tell you the process of the ninety minutes because yeah. that's not an easy thing to go down from two and a half hours. So. Maybe every six or eight weeks, he he would have me do a show, like a private show for himself, or and for me to invite people. And then he'd have people like Carl Reiner or oh. Liam Neeson to come to the show, and then weigh in: was it there or not, or was it, you know? So there's high stakes because I think yeah. each time I don't do it right, I I you know he won't want to continue on, right. So that fear was intense during that time. I wanted to take drugs and to anti anxiety. But no, uh, you take drugs. I didn't do drugs. <laughs> uh, it was a challenging time. So every six weeks, every eight weeks, six, I would be massaging it, putting it up, and it wouldn't be ready yet. And I think I got it. And then finally, he, he thought it was ready, and he goes, "I need for you to play it in Minneapolis. I mean, not Minneapolis. Some Midwest audience and my friends told me." about a little theater in Minneapolis. So I went up to this theater and performed there on Mel and Ann are coming to make a decision whether it's ready for New York or not based on Midwest audience now, because they want to see that it's going to play to everybody, every you know type of person. And I was quite nervous. And I get up there in the, in the theater is literally attached to a bowling alley. It's like the worst possible place to do a show that's a narrative arc. It's a show that's more for comedians, improvisers. And my show had a lot of laughs, but also a lot of emotion to it. Nice. So in the most intimate moment of my show, I would hear strike. You know, I'm like, oh, my God. <laughs> you know, they're going to come here. And this audience who's kind of Yahoo audience is not right for this show. They're not theater people. And so I really was quite nervous when they arrived. So I did something before they arrived to uh, I did something 
not right, Grace. You want to hear what I Oh, well, of course you did something not right. I love it. Because you're like, oh, oh, it. But, um, <laughs> I went to the Guthrie Theater, which was down the road, and uh, which was a very reputable theater. And they were showing a comedy by Sheridan. And I didn't watch the, the theater piece. I watched the audience. And in the intermission, I go up to people and I say, you know, Mel and Ann are coming to that sh shitty old bowling alley theater in one week. I swear to God, will you be my ringer? Will you be my ringer? Will you be my ringer? I literally handpicked from watching people who had good laughs. I watched who was laughing. I love and it. And so that night when Mel and Ann arrived, that audience was handpicked. Just the best it. ringers possible. And after I did the show, Mel and Ann came backstage and they said, oh my God, Ann, it's ready for New York. And the sh audiences up here are amazing. And I'm like, yeah, they are. They're incredible. <laughs> trickster by the way anyone who's listening and just tuned in this is ann randolph she's a genius and mel brooks said she's a genius i say she's a genius too i agree with mel and her, uh mel brooks the mel brooks and the late ann bancroft produced her off-broadway show so she's telling us the story i'm just tuning in <laughs> yeah because when you say Mel, I, I just want people to know it's not just Mel Brooks, Mel. Yeah. It's Mel Brooks okay? So go ahead, continue. Okay, continue. And then after that, they said, how about we go out and celebrate because we're going to New York. So we went to a fancy restaurant in Minneapolis. My director was with me, Alan Bailey. And we all ate and I think we had some wine. It all, you know, was a celebration because the show's ready. And it was a long ass time of getting yeah. ready for the show. So That's amazing. Now the next step was finding a theater in New York. I mean, there were many, many steps then to getting to finally open that show in New York. Oh, so what were the steps? How did that happen? Well, the first thing I'm kind of like left in New York to find a theater, like go find a theater and that you think would be right for your show. And this is interesting about New York, I have a lot of artists out there to find the theater for a solo show in New York, very challenging because all the theaters are very long and narrow and i find for solo show you want this width where it's kind of more like a community and i was like ah and right. the other thing shows are backed up meaning everybody's trying to get theaters in new york for off broadway very hard to find one that is available at the time that you want one i did not know that either <laughs> so eventually found a theater and now Mel is financing this along with another producer, Rob Bob Silliman, who produced a lot of Mel's stuff in New York. And um, so the show was to open, I think it was, yeah, the show was gonna open in May. So excited, I quit the shelter. This was now after 10 years of working there, said goodbye to everybody. I'm literally going from this minimum wage to New York and show's gonna open in May. And I'm back home in Ohio with my family, getting ready for this big uh, thing. It's a big dream of my whole entire life. Yes. And I get a call from Mel Brooks saying, Ann, I'm so sorry. We have to postpone the opening till August. Ann has been diagnosed with cancer. You can't tell anybody. Um, we're going to put you in the hands of another producer who's going to handle the day-to-day -day things to make it run because I need to focus on Ann during this time. And I totally understood Wow. And I got on the phone and, I, and he, he assured me that was Anne, Anne was going to be okay. And I was like, thank God, because, you know, she's my, yeah. my mentor, right? I mean, this is somebody I've grown to love and two years, you know, helping with the show. So of course it was now postponed to August and uh, that we're going to open. But as the weeks go on and like a month goes on, I hear very little from this producer. And I want to pick up the phone and call Mel and say, hey, this guy's not doing it. We can't go to a New York show and open eight shows a week without a machine behind us. Right. But I can't do it because I've now found out that Ann is dying. Oh. So it was this horrible. So I'm getting the dream at the same time. This this other thing's happening at the same time, Grace, that is yeah. devastating. It's just oh, like, oh, oh, the heartbreak of, you know, I'm coming towards an opening and I know there are a lot of artists out there and the machine is not behind you to support you. Mm -hmm. So I was like, okay, yeah. And so I literally was like, I had this belief that if I got this incredible review in the New York Times on opening night, even though there wasn't a marketing machine be behind me, that review would turn everything around. Right. So 
opening night came in New York in August, and it's also during the Republican convention, right? Worst, oh, wow. if you're out there, it's the worst time to open a show. Everybody knows everybody goes to Long Island in August, worst possible time. And it's during the Republican convention. George Bush is up for re-election. Oh my yeah. God. And so New York has kind of cleared out. Yeah, 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 yeah right? Yeah. I'm uh, doing my opening night. My friends, family have all flown in from Ohio and Ann and Mel are there. And I remember Ann, she had a wig now from the treatments. It was just like this mix of this, I'm doing it and this also heartbreak at the same time. Yeah. It was so hard. And, and also to know that there was not a lot of seats sold. I mean, I was not getting good houses because I had to have pre-advanced sales, right? But you can't right. pre-advanced sales if not anybody really knows about you. Right. And, and I want to say to anybody, this was not Mel and Ann's. This was the, another producer who did not pick up the ball. And it was my fault because I didn't pick up the phone and say something. I just felt like one of those people, uh, inflatable things in front of a used car lot, Grace. You know, where it's right. like right. fight, flight, or freeze. I just froze. Yeah, 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 yeah. It's such a whirlwind time of fear. And so show opens and uh, next day I run to the New York Times and I get this amazing review in the New York Times. It's great. I think wow. it's going to turn, turn this audience around, but it, it doesn't turn it around. And Mel sees what's happening now. And he picks up the ball and he starts taking out like a quarter page ad in the New York Times for $20,000 saying with the pull quotes from the New York Times to turn the ship around. You know, he's like, get, yeah, you know, and he's going on uh, New York One and different things doing interviews because Ann and I were supposed to do interviews. Ann can't do interviews now, right? Mm -hmm. So these, yeah. so all these things are happening. And then, but we couldn't fill those seats for week on out, week on out, week on out. So show ran like uh, three weeks with incredible reviews and it closed. Oh, wow. So devastating. Oh my God. Talk about grief. This yeah. is my fifth solo show I had written and I thought, well, I'll never have this chance again. This is like, and I also had guilt for even having that thought, you know, because my mentor has cancer. She's not, she's dying. So this mixture of self-loathing, mm -hmm for even thinking about myself, but also thinking I've been working my whole life. So towards this thing, it was just such a mixture of emotion, an incredible right. amount of loss. So yeah. the show closed, right? And now what? Yeah, broke with incredible reviews from New York City. But broke. Yeah. Oh my God. And what, what happened next? What did you do next? Uh, what happened next was I had to go back home and live with my parents, you know? No. And I'm on my, you know, in my parents' house with books on the shelf that say like, do what you love and the money will follow. And I'm like, fuck you, you know? <laughs> and, uh, and so I had this immense grief and then, yeah. you know, then my dad, he got diagnosed with lung cancer. My mother had a stroke paralyzed on one side. It was like, boom, let me whack you some more. Boom, let me whack you some more. Damn. A lot of grief in a short amount of time. A lot of loss. Yeah. yeah. And, you know, many listeners out there have probably encountered a lot of, you know, we're all having immense loss now. And, and I tell you, some miracles happened during that time because I just was at that point. I don't want to go on. I'll never have this opportunity. Wow. This will never happen again. Wow. And, yeah. And what happened is what always happens. I know if I pick up that pen and I start writing, mm -hmm. something will come through. And so the next show I wrote was a comedy about death, death and sex. And it was, uh, and I have to say something, as I started to pick up that pen, I'm living at my parents' house, something truly magical happened, like very universal, very woo woo crazy. Yeah. <laughs> I pick up the pen and Literally like the next week I get a letter in the mail from an old boyfriend's mother who was in the audience that night in New York, had heard what had happened and she knew my whole history. And she sent me a check for $10,000 and said, get back on your feet. Oh my God, like you're a total angel. Total angel. And then about a month later, this producer who was also in New York during that time said, and your show is phenomenal. Yes. I'm going to book you in all the top regional theaters across the country. So that would be a year and a half out, you know, because regional theaters book a year and a half out. So all of a sudden 
a year and a half out, I was going to have income. I was going to play all the top regional theaters and I was going to make money. So I think about that now. It was such a gift because I got to be with my mother and father during that time. And um, so you think when you're in the middle of it, why, why God, why? Yeah. <laughs> and I think now it was the best thing that happened artistically because yeah. it forced me to go deeper mm -hmm. in grief. And as a comedian, the deeper you go into pain, boy, the better the, the laughs get. Absolutely. Yeah. So it was the best show I ever wrote was this one that I did on, on loss and grief. And that show went on to open in San Francisco in, I want to say 2011, then won the best solo show in 2012, then opened right. then toured the country. It sold out for two years straight, then toured, played the arena stage in Washington, DC. And yeah, it's been like a huge success. So amazing. What was the name of that show? That was called Loveland. Oh, that's the one I saw. That's the one you saw, Grace. That's the one I saw, yes. Yeah. What a great show. Yeah, and I've written a new show. show about what I'm sharing with you called Inappropriate in All the Right Ways, and a producer's yes. this up to take this show as option it for New York. So look, you have 20 zillion chances. Uh, that's amazing. So tell me about this new show, because I see that the I have on my notes, the Washington Post says, and Randolph is inappropriate in all the right ways. So that's the name of your show now. Yeah, because the Washington Post gave me the title. They gave me a review for Loveland. The review yeah. for Loveland was Anne Randolph is inappropriate. I thought that is a great title. I'm going to steal it and use it for my next show. And that is so you also. Yeah. So yeah. Why, why are you inappropriate in all the right ways? Can you tell us? That's a good question. I, that's I, a deep question. <laughs> I don't know what to say, but I mean, I'll say anything. I, I mean, I think there's like this, this inappropriate, but underneath it is this connection to human. Like we feel our connection in our imperfection. Yes. And I'm not sure what comedy is about. Yeah. Absolutely. You go to that deep, dark shame and you bring it up and you, you know, do you masturbate? Do you meditate? Do you masturbate? Do you meditate? You know, or, uh, yeah, you, you make light off the pain. Basically that's what we do. Yeah. 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 You so, know about this, Grace. You know all about this. We all know about this, right? Yeah. yeah. And the more, the deeper the pain, the more comedy we get. It's so weird. Yeah. I yeah. know. But we turn pain into money, which is lovely. <laughs> <laughs> it's a gift. Oh, my God. Comedian, we turn pain into money. Oh, my God. Yeah, of course. Yeah, that's what we yeah. do. That's our job. Yeah. Uh, so what propelled you to start writing and performing solo shows? Why did you choose that format? It's all about me, Grace. <laughs> right. Well, it's, oh, of course. <laughs> because I'm a stage hog. I admit it. I yeah, you are. Stage you're a stage ho. Yeah. I'm a stage hog. I'm a whore. A prostitute. And you're hilarious. So you can be a stage ho, you know, for the rest yeah. of your life. Because you, I'm telling you, can anybody see anything uh, of you, like any clips or anything or, or uh, I, you know, because this theater is not stand up. And so it's always been, well, that's been so daggone challenging. If you're a theater artist out there to sell yourself, your solo show, super challenging, unless you're doing one liners. But if you're doing a narrative arc and the, and the comedy is coming from the characters, very hard to do. And I have to say for the arena stage in Washington, DC, they'd heard about my show and they said, send me your script. And I knew if I sent that script, I would not get the gig. Yeah. So I said, I'll come there. I'll pay my own expenses. I will pack that house. And I bet if you see it live, you'll book it. So I took a risk. Nice. And it worked. It's not going to work if I send a tape. So tapes suck. So they talk. Okay. So we're not. So for me, we, for me, for you, for you, are you going to, where are you going to perform this show? Inappropriate in all the right ways. Yes. Inappropriate in all the right ways. Well, this is like, I have now a New York producer who's looking for theaters. She's looking to partner with another executive producer to bring the show to New York. Oh, fantastic. all the way from Hawaii to New York. Yes. I love it. Yeah. Solo shows cannot be taped and enjoyed. It's, it, it's a live theater thing. Yeah. Yeah, it's almost like stand up also. Stand up, yes, if you produce it well, it can, but it reads so much better in person. Yeah, it's, it's just so super hard. hard. Yeah. It's the same and thing. No, it's super hard. Try doing a joke on Zoom and people are muted. It's, it's uh, 
I know. I've been doing the Zoom shows. That's my credit. It's been my cred for the last four months. A lot of Zoom shows. Yeah. Lovely. Great. I love it. Yeah, totally. And and now you're a, a teacher, right? Also, you teach people how to write their own solo show. And I took your class after yes. I saw your show because I thought you were brilliant. And yeah, of course. And, and, and you're fantastic. Like you have all these amazing techniques to bring the best out in in people the the best like your your best writer comes out because you have all these different methods and strategies uh and, and i know that you're doing some kind of 21 day challenge yeah I can buy, right 21 so day writing challenge. yeah yeah so is there a website where people can go and yeah, they can go to mrandolph.com. It's there. And, and the other thing is I've started this irreverent, reverent church hall called happy cock church. Okay. You need to tell me what that is based on the rooster. So you it, but you need to expand a little bit. There it is in the background. I don't know. Happy cock church. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> I love it. <laughs> so tell me about the happy cock church. Happy cock church right there. Yeah. It's, I feel like I, I'm surrounded by cocks, Grace. In <laughs> Welcome to my world. Yeah. Well, when you're a comedian, you're surrounded by them. Yeah, yes, you are. Of I don't I'm know if we're talking about the same kind, but yeah. <laughs> yeah. Think about Hawaii, like you have a little. Yeah. The, oh, the, okay. Yeah. There's a hurricane came, uh, Nikki, 19, I think 92, and, and it blew all the rooster coops away. So they all just oh, run wild. God. There are cocks everywhere and like oh, all day. <laughs> so like roaming the, the island. Yeah, everywhere. Oh wow. So there you food land, there's a gas station. Yeah, cocks. <laughs> all these cocks. You were like happy cock church. So what is what is the mission of happy cock church? Well, it's where we uh minister to one another with our stories. So we all minister and we share with each other. So I have these little breakout rooms and I give writing prompts and I give a meditation and I have a kind of an irreverent sermon, but it's really about you, the, the cock aggregation. Um, <laughs> the aggregation. <laughs> writing, oh and sharing. writing is sharing, Grace. It's That's all about writing and sharing. So. That's hilarious. Yeah. That is, I love that. Uh, so tell me a little bit about like some writing strategies that you have when you write your solo show. Well, what is your creative process? Uh, creative process. Well, always I go for where I am in a contradiction with myself, where there's inner conflict, where I'm at war. So I want to mine where I'm at war and then I go for it. Like if I'm, you know, I always like meditate or masturbate, right? Those two could be seen as at war, but they shouldn't be because they're both about self-love. But right. I think it's where I'm hung up on something within my life that is not working. And I want to really investigate and oh. mind. It. And so that's where I will begin, where where there's where I'm rubbing up against something. And a good writing prompt for, for that is uh, what I really want to say is dot, 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 you know, what's on my mind right this very minute. And I think the other thing I like to do, which I do in the workshops is I move that body. Like I write on my feet. Like some people can yeah. sit down at that computer. I like to have the recorder in my hand and start moving and seeing what's coming out and then let it rip. Oh, that's the best. I've done that in your workshops and that is absolutely the best because there's a lot of stuff that you probably don't even think about or, or they don't come out when you're in front of a computer or even yeah. write it with somebody else. It's a little, it's a step above writing on your own. But I think when you're performing, that's like amazing. That's yeah. the best ideal situation. So do you create a lot of your stuff on your feet? Yes. Writing and sitting down? Yeah, because I like to move as if I'm doing a character, mm -hmm. if I'm doing somebody like who talks like this or her name is Jolene, whatever, I'm going to start moving as her and I put the tape, when I move as her, the dialogue comes effortlessly. But if I sit at my computer and I'm not moving as her, then it's much harder for me. So I like yeah. to channel people and I can channel them when I'm in them. And even if I'm not channeling people, it's this feeling I'm tapping into this yeah. emotion. Yeah. 
Yeah. It's something inside you or, or something yeah. that you, you've you seen out there and it stayed with you and then it comes out when you, your body is in a certain, yeah, moves yeah. a certain way or, yeah. So you're very physical. Yes. I'm you're physical. a very physical comedian too. You, you use your body really well. Yeah. So do you have any techniques to help people that don't know how to use their body for comedy? They're just like, blah, 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 blah. <laughs> they use their body. Well, they masturbate besides that. <laughs> they use their body. Well, I just start like if you like just start with like, I know this is going to sound really weird, but like if you start moving your arm and you just ask, this sounds very airy fairy, how does the arm want to move? And you just let, let's start doing something yeah. and <laughs> it will take you somewhere like <laughs> what the fuck, you know, what the fuck <laughs> like, it immediately like, came up to me. Yeah, and it just it's in there, and I didn't know that until I just did that. Right now, I'm improvising. Yeah, really, you're just playing with yourself, Grace. Right? So you're. Uh, and the other thing I like to do is just take a repetitious movement, like when you put your body in a mood, you're like, mmm, mmm, mmm. So that could be like the state of yearning. It could be the state of mmm. I don't know. Whatever flavor you do, a repetitious movement and sound. And then dialogue will come out of you like almost effortlessly when you engage in that movement and sound, something will surprise you. And it's, it sounds uh, really out there, but it is not, you know, because no, I've, I've so had weird ass theater teachers before. I'm like, <laughs> <laughs> well, the body, the, the soul and the spirit, they're all connected. Yeah. So yeah, yeah the body will actually, tell you sicknesses are just basically what's happening in your soul coming out in your body oh grace yeah right so your yeah. body will, will talk to you and it talks to me like whenever i'm allergic to something it's because that's not a good thing that's a bad thing for you so yeah. my body is smart you know so it'll go with it goes with your soul it goes, it's all together we're just all one thing you know yes a body a soul or a spirit it's all one thing so um, so tell me about, um, uh, besides like the physical, you know, inspiration, do you have, and, and of course life, do you have any other sources of inspiration? Well, yeah. Uh, well, and I wanted to talk one more thing about that is that the body, the mind will censor you, but the body won't. So you're getting a really true expression of sometimes like the unconscious is made conscious. I love that. Between sound and movement. And you're like, Oftentimes, if you're working with the narrative arc and you're like, what is blocking my character? Because in any narrative story, solo show, the characters after something, they have a want and a need. Right. If something keeps tripping them up. And what is that? And a lot of solo shows I see, the what's tripped up is the person will say, well, this happened to me, this happened to me, this happened to me. And what this exercise does to me is that it shows where I trip up my own self over and over again, where I take responsibility or here's something unconscious. I didn't know that I had this particular way of behaving. I didn't know until I did this exercise. Exactly. Um, it's this thing that in any solo show, you want to have the victim, hero, and perpetrator. Like we have to have all three of those and, and mining all three parts of ourselves because we have all three parts of that within us. Yes. And if we're not, if we're only, you know, inviting, I'm the victim and I'm the hero. No, you have to look at the part where you're, you're flawed. You are messed up. Totally. Absolutely. Yeah. I'm actually, you know what I'm doing now? I figured what? out how to put your name and your title. Oh, I did it. <laughs> Thanks. It's so cool. Well, Lauren, sorry. I have ADHD. I was listening and at the same time doing this. So, um, we both about. have ADHD. These creative types have boom, boom, boom. Oh, yeah, all over the place. Yeah. yeah. Like you can do 50 things at the same time. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. I do that all the time. So, and also the conversations, like when two ADHD people talk, it's like we understand each other. We it's we start on point A and we end up on point, you know, yeah. in two seconds. Like, And then we go back to A, to M, to N. It's like, and we understand each other. We do. I know it, it's crazy. I know I, I once um, had a boyfriend who had Asperger's and they're very hyper-focused, right? 
Yes. So it's kind of like the opposite of ADHD. Yeah. So I told him a story. So I was like all over the place, you know, like for 10 minutes, like telling him a story, like going from one thing to the other, sidebar, sidebar. So, yeah. okay. so I end the story and he goes, I have no idea what you just said. <laughs> <laughs> oh my God, great. That is so funny because it's, he had, he could not follow at all. It was oh, hilarious. Yeah. yeah, he kind of taught me how to be more focused so I could communicate better. Yeah. <laughs> so, I love imagining with somebody with Asperger's, you know, and I think ADHD myself, I've been attracted to more as it, it's just what I'm turned on by. Same here. I love like really, really smart, focused. You me too. I think outside the box and definitely Asperger's matches yeah. that. Yeah. Yeah. We're still yeah. friends with this guy, so he's not my boyfriend anymore, but we're still friends. Yeah, because he's he's great. I admire him tremendously. So, yeah. I, so tell I, me, um, you know how we all prepare for shows, right? Like I, we all have our own rituals. Do you have any particular rituals before you go up on stage? Yeah, the bathroom, Grace. <laughs> <laughs> no, you got to make sure that the hole, it's empty. I know the bladder yeah. is empty. I know. Yeah. Definitely. But besides that, do you have like any weird spiritual or like physical rituals yeah. that you do? What do you do? I definitely do a vocal exercise. I don't know if that's a ritual, but and I also do squats right before going on stage. Squats? Why? Right. To get that lower body engaged. Like, that I want that. Body. And right. I want to feel grounded. So I'll do right. these breathing and I'll definitely squat and get that lower body there. And then I really slow down my breath. Like, like I try to not amp myself up. I used to in the olden days try to amp myself up. Now I just get to this place of can I be completely present? And that's from relaxation, slowing down. Yeah. No, umping yourself up is just gives it takes you to a place of like weirdness. Yeah. Right. When you're like so yeah, I think grounding yourself is very important before you go up on the stage for yeah. sure. Yeah, and just yeah. the breath is good because it grounds you and it, it calms your mind also, right? Yes. Yeah. So yeah. that's good. I love that. Um yeah. so tell me, what was the your favorite show that you've ever written? Loveland, for sure. Loveland, the one yeah. about that happened after New York. Yeah, that piece it it ripped, I think I, you know, in New York, I was still wearing a mask. So am I, you know, in some sense, I, you know, it was that roomy quote, tear off your mask, your face is glorious. I think grief friggin' ripped my mask off. Right. And I didn't, I thought I wasn't hiding in the last show, but that, this one really, like, I felt like I got stripped another layer for sure. Wow. And because of that, I felt tremendous liberation. The minute you pull off another layer of your mask, you feel more liberated. For sure. Do you oh. find that the more you liberate yourself, which comedy does that, you know, art in general yeah. does that, right? Like it takes, it, it's almost like it's hard to communicate with regular people who are not artists. Sometimes yeah. for me it is, I have to like control my mouth. Yeah. <laughs> or I say something all over shit, I shouldn't have said that. Back yeah. it up, yeah, I take yeah. it back, I take it back, I did not say that. Yeah. Uh, yeah, you do that a lot, right? Yes. <laughs> Yes. <laughs> yeah. This is like too late. It just came out of my mouth and it does not sound good. And it's just so it's almost like we're we're pure spirits. We're like I think artists when they're real artists and, and they're real um and, and they're um honest and about yeah. who they are. Yeah. I think it's like pure spirits, you know, yeah. pure hearts. It's like <laughs> shit comes out and you're like I know I shouldn't say that, but that's the truth. And that's, you know, what I see. And yeah, so and it's- thank God, thank God you do that, you know? Isn't, yeah, no, it's like, but I, now I warn people, it's like, you want to hear the truth. You know, my mom used to call me, it's like, Graciela, I'm calling you because I need to hear the truth. <laughs> so go ahead and tell me and tell me. I know, I know I'm not going to like it, but go ahead. <laughs> Oh, Grace, I love that. I love hearing your mother's voice because I remember we used to work on that. And I know. we're going to force, but hearing your story. Now it's all coming back. I yeah. know, I know. My mom, yeah, with her accent. Oh my gosh, yeah. she was hysterical. She didn't mean to be funny, but she was a character for sure. Yeah. Um, so um, I want to ask you 
Okay, what is your favorite curse word and why? Oh my God, favorite curse word. I think I say, well, right now it's cock. I love cock, but I don't think that's a curse word. I just like cock. <laughs> You like the word. Yeah, I remember that. K, it's the comedy K. It's got, k k k k you know, it's just so good. Yeah, I know. It it's is good. Word, but I couldn't help but name my church that because I love it so much. So. Oh, my God. That's so funny. Yeah. Your yeah. church, the cock, happy cock church, everybody. You need to check that out. Is there a website that people can ha check out? Happycockchurch.com. <laughs> it's a church you can come to. <laughs> my god that's really oh, bad i'm sorry oh my god this is too funny uh so let me let me tell you uh first of all if anybody has any questions uh for ann about writing your own solo show um i know that you coach people do you have any um a web a website or anything that you want to any information you want to give out so people can uh yeah. coach with you yeah they can go to annrandolph.com and I think the offerings I have right now are the 21 day writing challenge and also happy cock church is on there and you, or you can go to happycockchurch.com. The other thing I do do coaching with people on their solo show. And I enjoy that very much because I think I'm really good at figuring out the arc of a story. You're amazing. I, I trained with you. Uh, you helped me with my solo show and uh, yeah, you're, you're amazing. You're just brilliant. You're a genius. Matt Brooks was right. <gasps> He is right. You are a genius, and it, it's true. So, any uh, do you want to promote anything? Uh, I know the writing course. People can subscribe to that writing course online. It's only ninety nine dollars, right? For yeah, it's cheap. Yeah, yeah. So, tell me, tell us a little bit. What does that entail? And well, I'm always interested in tapping the thing that you know, that is unseen. And I, this could sound woo woo, but I play the harmonium, which is this instrument. And it seems to almost put somebody in kind of like a trans state, right? And then once somebody's in that kind of really relaxed state, I throw out the writing pump and then we write together online for like 35 minutes. And then that's a, or 40 minutes, a chunk of time for you to really commit to like, you know, putting the writing down. And there's something about being a community, like, like as we're in community right now, you can feel this aliveness. And I think for me, I need it to write in. I do very well in community. Yeah. Even though it's online, it's much better than me being alone. Like I know other people are concentrating their energy in that moment to create. And I like that. Oh, so that's what's happening online. That starts on the 26th. And then Abbeycock Church, you can come to anytime, every weekend. It's, it's there and you can come for free you can pay a donation it's it's church the church doors are open free cock free cock there That's we go of that phrase. free cock free cock yeah. uh, so your social media then you have Anne randolph on facebook do you have an ig Handle? i have an ig Anne randolph i think it's I don't know what that is oh that's terrible I know it's an Ann Randolph something so. <laughs> okay Twitter same and thing I start, not Twitter I just started a happy cock church account on Instagram I think I, I like a week ago so I don't have hardly any viewers but or people but you can be my people so <laughs> Help your people <laughs> you can be my people yeah all right thank you so much Ann I, I love you you're amazing it was so great to catch up with you yeah great yeah it it's great awesome. to see and hear what a beautiful thing you're giving to comedians and artists oh my god thank you, thank you. Oh, yeah. well we have to support each other right yeah absolutely so anybody who wants to take that 21 day writing class with ann go to her website and subscribe it's only 99 dollars, and she is amazing she's the best writing coach you'll find in uh in the country on the planet on the planet. On the planet. Yeah. On the planet. Yeah. In the world, in the universe. Oh, hello. I, I, I believe it. <laughs> you know it. All right. So, great. Thank you so much, girl. And uh, thank you, everybody, for tuning in. And I will see you next Sunday at 7 p.m. Pacific Standard Time. Bye, everyone. Bye, Anne. Bye. Thank you.